Hey guys, welcome back to another interview here on Toned In Entertainment today. I'm really excited because I have Jeff Beard in here with me, and he is also the author of this new book, The Man Behind the Makeup. How are you doing, Jeff? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm fantastic, man. Uh, first off, author, did you ever yes, think sir. you would write a book while you were out there slaying the smackdown out there? Well, you know, it's one of those things and stuff, and I'm sure... You know, there's hundreds of other wrestlers and stuff that have heard the same thing and stuff. It's like, oh, your life seems so interesting. Why don't you write a book? And so, you know, it's one of those things that I've kicked around and everything. And, but you've done so many things. You've been so many places and stuff. It make for a great book. And then, you know, finally, and stuff, we just decided to do it. And so my wife and I, you know, my wife and I sat down and put the, put the book together. And, you know, we own our own uh, publishing company and our own public relations company. So we, it was easy and stuff to go through all that and stuff to get the to get the booked out. I was gonna say that's got to be like I would think one of the most challenging things, but you g- kind of skipped a few steps or didn't. We have skipped to go a through. few steps by what we do in you know regular life after wrestling and stuff. So, okay, perfect. Now, as a wrestler, I mean, many wrestlers go under different monikers, right? You know, throughout the years, and you definitely had a few personas. Because so, I'm gonna ask you to maybe break down each of these personas okay uh how would you describe the giant warrior that was really where i started making my name in wrestling and stuff with giant warrior i didn't really like the name but carlos cologne when i went to work in puerto rico that was the name he gave me so i kind of worked under and then i started working other places and it just kind of evolved but i didn't really like the name in the beginning because there were too many warriors wearing makeup and everything else. And it's like, oh, you're trying to be ultimate warrior. Oh, you're trying to be the road warriors. And, you know, it really had nothing to do with that. I mean, it really kind of got started. I was, I first worked as Butch Masters, you know, doing a cowboy gimmick. But, you know, uh, after doing that for a little bit, the ca- the cowboy gimmick was really kind of dead. And Bill Ash and stuff, he used to make all the wrestling boots and stuff in Arkansas. He called me to come in and do a show for him. And I was working against Skywalker Nitron and stuff that was working with, uh, was like a bodyguard, I think, for w- in WCW for Doom. And he was about my size. He was 6'10". And so Bill brought us in. And, you know, after our match and stuff, he pulled us back to the back and stuff. And he said, have you two ever thought about putting a tag team together? And we were like, no, we never thought about it. I mean, we really just met each other. And so we sat down and started talking about it. And, you know, he, he was using the makeup and everything. So it was kind of like, do we kind of switch to do his gimmick or do we switch to do mine? And like I said, the cowboy gimmick was kind of dead, you know, so we went with the makeup and, you know, through a course of things, uh, we called Dory Funk Jr. and stuff, who's my trainer. You know, I, I grew up with the Funks and Dory is like, sure. And stuff. he said, let me get you into Puerto Rico and stuff so you can get a little experience before you go to Japan. And so I got in there and stuff and Carlos decided to call me Giant Warrior because, you know, my height and everything else and that's name kind of stuck with me for about six years or so before i quit using it yeah because when you like youtube giant warrior you get a lot of andre the giant you get a lot of ultimate warrior so it's kind of like you have to put your name jeff bearded in there as well in order to find your matches on youtube that or giant warrior wrestling and stuff you can find it that's true that is true. that way and stuff too so but yeah, so I mean, I wasn't, you know, I didn't really like the idea and stuff of what we were, the Giant Warrior. I wish we could come up with a different name, but, you know, it started working for me. So then it's like, well, okay, it's it's going good. So there's no, you know, let's take it and run with it. Now, what about Butch Masters? How would you describe Butch Masters more than just a cowboy? You know, I was, um, I actually started with Crockett Promotions and stuff. So Dusty, Dusty Rhodes was really the one who got me doing the cowboy gimmick because he said, you know, I was I was a basketball player coming out. You know, play, I just got through playing pro ball in Europe. You know, I was 260 maybe. So, I mean, I was I was really tall and thin. So I reminded him of, of, of an old wrestler, Tex McKenzie. And so that was where he kind of put the cowboy gimmick on me and stuff. And so I did that for a little while. And, you know, I left Crockett to try to get some more work because I wouldn't get to work a lot. And so I started doing like a little outlaw shows and stuff doing that. And then um, I got invited to go to Mexico doing that. So I worked for CMLL. It was really my first big group to be working with. And so I did the cowboy gimmick, you know, with cowboy hat, shaft vest, bull rope, glove, using the claw, the whole bit. 
you know, so I was probably closer to Black Jack Mulligan at the time. <laughs> now, and, now I, oh, go ahead. So then, you know, like I said, then we worked for Bill Ash and just kind of switched it up, and then Giant Warrior was kind of born. Okay. Now, I grew up in the 80s, and I remember, you know, all the gimmicks. You know, it was the Road right. Warriors, it was Demolition. I mean, One Man Gang turned into a keen, the African Dream. Like, it was right. just crazy gimmicks. So, like, and today here in 2022, a lot of guys wrestle under, like, their personas now. So, when you went right. into, like, you know, maybe a promotion, and they were looking, like, did you have to have some type of gimmick? You know, it just kind of worked out that way. Um you know, my, you know, my name did, did, on its own didn't really mean a whole lot. So, I mean, we had to, so we kind of came up with the personas, the different personas, and I kind of changed a couple, you know, later in my career, I changed it up to kind of refresh myself. Now, speaking of refreshing yourself, what about Colossus? The Colossus was the last one I did, and I wished I'd have thought of that when I first started. Because it, it really was a good gimmick and stuff that nobody had really done. You know, and I mean, I was, let's see, I went from Giant Warrior to Tiger Steel, then Tiger Steel to Colossus. And Colossus and stuff came about because I was watching the movie Gladiator. And I got to watching what they were doing and, you know, the tunics and the big belts and the helmets and everything else. So, I mean, I, I worked with a guy in um, London that built me my helmet and my le you know, leather helmet so that it looked like the one from Gladiator and the, the big leather skirt and everything else. And I really had fun doing that toward the end of my career. I just wanted to do something fresh and try that gimmick because I thought it would be a good one and it worked well for me. So I wished I would have come up with that, you know, in 87 when I started. Yeah. Cause there is a picture in the book of you wearing that outfit and legitimately it looks like you really just walked off a movie set. Yeah. I mean, I, I really love putting that gimmick together and, and everything else. And I had, I had a little bit of success with it when I used it, but you know, so, but yeah, like I said, I really wish I'd have come up that in the, in the very beginning. Now let's talk about Big Tiger Steel, the last one here. That he, that name came about, um, I, I was living in South Africa, helping in the, helping run the wrestling office there. And I'd been doing Giant Warrior there for off and on. You know, I, I toured South Africa like three times, three or four times a year for a couple of years before I was asked to come to move there and help and stuff with the office. So I had been wrestling all over South Africa so many times that it, uh, I was starting to come a little bit stale because people had seen me so often, you know, it's kind of like Andre and stuff. If you bring Andre in every week, every time you're wrestling in that town, that then he's not as impressive as he was the first time they saw me. And I was kind of going through the same thing. You know, they'd seen me so many times that I needed to come up with something new. So we, you know, I took a six month break and Paul Lloyd and I sit and figured out stuff, what we could do for, for something different. And he knew that, you know, I always had a big love for tigers. So he's like, well, let's use tiger and stuff. You name you're big, you're strong. Let's lose tiger steel. I said, well, if we're going to use steel, let's put the E at the end of it and stuff instead of, you know, think of a piece of metal. And that was kind of how I came up with tiger steel. So I did that probably the last year or so that I lived in South Africa. And then I started working in Europe and that was, you know, that was all the stuff that I had set up for was doing Tiger Steel. So I took it to Europe. That worked real well. So I just kept using it and stuff for a long time. Now, speaking of Andre the Giant, at least the stories, you know, that I've heard, you know, through the grapevine, is he was kind of like a guy that took no nonsense and you were in the ring with him. Um, so how was your experience being in the ring with Andre the Giant? Andre was good to me. Um, you know, maybe it came and stuff for me being so closely associated with the Funks and Dick Murdoch and the guys that trained me and stuff. So maybe he gave me a break because of that. But um, I remember the first time we got ready to lock up, we did the big test, you know, test of strength thing. And I don't know if it was the look on my face or what, but Andre started laughing. And I, you know, I've got pretty big hands. You know, because I'm a legit seven foot person. And stuff. I was going to so say, I'm, you are seven foot one. Yeah, I'm seven foot and a half inch. I don't ever claim it, though. Okay. But, uh, you know, they booked me as seven two for my whole career, just like they booked Andre seven four. And I mean, he was maybe a half inch taller than I was and stuff. Andre, he wasn't the seven four they claimed, but I wasn't the seven two either. But I guess it was the look on my face because I've never seen my hand look small to anybody. And I, my fingertips just barely got over the palm of his hand. I just got up to the first crease of his knuckles. 
And I had never seen that before. So I don't know if it was the expression on my face that made him laugh or, or what and stuff. But I mean, we, you know, we worked really well together. I would love to have wrestled Andre 10, 15 years earlier in his career and probably five or six years later in mine. Cause you know, I was, I was really green still when I went to, went to Japan and stuff and worked that first time. So, I mean, I wish we'd been able to cross paths at different, at a different time point, because it would have been fun working with Andre and I could have learned a lot and stuff from working for somebody my size. Cause you know, that was the thing when you're a giant, you know, like I am, there's not that many people to really learn from, but you know, it, it was a great experience wrestling Andre. I, I just never seen anybody that, you know, worked with anybody that size. Now I go to a lot of uh, local shows here uh, in the independent scene. Like I'm a huge fan and I see, you know, a lot of the same fans over and over and over again, while you right. were out touring, uh, would you see some of those regular fans over and over again? And if you did, what were some of maybe like the, the things that stood out about them? You know, it was, I did see that. Cause I mean, every tour that I went on, I was always invited back. So when I would go back, there would be a lot of people that would, you know, come back up to me and stuff. And Oh, I, I saw you the last time you were here. You know, here you signed my magazine. This one, we signed this one too. And, you know, everybody was always very cordial and, and friendly and stuff with me, even though I was pretty much a heel for 25 of my 30 years. You know, was, I never tried to just be that really aloof kind of person. I didn't mind signing autographs. Um, but, I, you know, I didn't get too close and stuff because of that reason. And I didn't like to stay outside the dressing room a lot and stuff because it kind of took away of the the impact of my size and stuff if they've been looking at me all night sitting back signing autographs and everything else you know so i mean I, I didn't stay out a lot amongst the crowd was it hard to keep kayfabe back in those days i mean now i feel like it's almost impossible and oh. only a few, few guys can really do it what about yeah, no, i mean were... i liked it better in the kayfabe days it was a lot more fun for me instead of trying to make people believe what we were doing were real and I felt like the heat that you got back then was a lot ge more genuine than what you get now because everybody, you know, pretty well knows what's going on. All you got to do is watch the internet for a little bit and you can figure out a good part of our, how the business runs and, you know, things like that. So that's kind of taken the fun away from it for me. And that was one reason why I like working international shows all the time is because I can remember going into two or three different countries as if where people would tell me, uh, you better be ready tonight stuff because our wrestling here is real. It's not like that fake stuff in the States. So, you know, and I enjoyed that more. Now, speaking of, uh, you know, keeping a kayfabe and keeping it real there, you were involved with some riots at one point. I was involved well. with a lot of riots. Okay. Can you tell me just like, I don't know, one crazy riot story. And maybe, oh, maybe we'll do a second. Probably the craziest one and the scariest one that I was involved with was in, um, I think it was Westville University in Durban, South Africa. And so we had, we were setting up for a feud between me and Gama Singh because Gama, you know, being Indian was over huge in Durban because Durban's probably got a 90% Indian population in it. So he was, he was God to them. And we had just, I had worked an earlier match and kind of beat my opponent down pretty bad and, you know, blood and everything else. And Gama was finishing up a two out of three series with another South African wrestler. And they had finished their match. And as he was talking to the crowd and, you know, I came to the ring and stuff and challenged him. And, you know, he's like, you're a lot bigger than I am. And I just got through wrestling this grueling match that, you know, what's, I'm not wrestling you tonight. As he turned to walk out of the ring and stuff, I came from behind and stuff and hit him in the back you know, bounced him off the ropes, gave him a couple of boots. And I mean, here come the chairs. And I mean, they were flying hard and fast. So I, I actually ended up having to sit on a chair and take a chair and put it over my head to protect myself. And probably 45 seconds, a minute, that ring was piled higher than the ring ropes. You couldn't see me and stuff on the little bit of film that they had of it. Camera guy got scared at that point and left. And so nothing else got recorded. But they piled all the chairs on and I could, you know, I'm sitting here, I couldn't move. You know, and they were the, you know, like plastic school chairs and stuff, you know, that are already molded and everything. 
and I couldn't move. And I started smelling smoke. One of the fans had tried to set the ring on fire. They were trying to get the, the canvas lit. And I'm sitting under here and it's like, I can't move. I can't go anywhere and stuff. So, I mean, this thing goes on fire and stuff. I'm dead. And then I started hearing gunshots. I thought, oh my God. <laughs> now I'm sitting under a bunch of plastic chairs and they're shooting guns. Not a safe place to be either. <laughs> And then the lights went out. And then I could hear the dogs because the riot squad had showed up with all the riot dogs. And so everything kind of the lights, I see the lights come back on and we started taking, um, they started pulling the chairs off of me after they got everybody cleared out of the building. And as we were pulling chairs, as if I had turned around to take a chair and throw it to the floor. And there was a guy standing in the corner that had been taking chairs off of me the whole time too. So I thought he was you know, part of the ring crew. And as I turned back around to grab a chair to throw out, as I threw it out, the guy took a knife and stabbed me in the chest. And the promoter, Paul Lloyd and stuff, actually shot the guy off of the ring apron. He shot the guy. He shot the guy off the ring apron and it stabbed me. And when we got to the back, the doctor told me that he said, you are so lucky you don't even realize it. He said, had that knife been going horizontal he said it would have gone through your ribs and got your heart he said thankfully and stuff it was going vertical so when it hit my rib it bounced up so that was the only thing that saved me that night well, and that was probably the craziest one but i mean i had i hope you don't have a crazier than that one getting not, stabbed not than that one. i mean i just had fire. some crazy nights i mean it was really strange i mean it was um i got stabbed in mexico city dominican republic Cape Town, South Africa, and twice in Durban, South Africa. Wow. Like, well, here in the States, you know, when I go to AEW or WWE or whatever, yeah, you're going to walk through security. You're going to get your metal detectors. But I've never seen, a, like, a riot squad or riot dogs. Was that something that was just, like, common when you traveled? At least, You know, I didn't see it too often. But, I mean, there were times in the right places, you know, I would, I was able to get a lot of heat. And, you know, in places like that, they're so nationalistic and they've, you know, there's believe so hard in their heroes and stuff there. Then, yeah, you could get things going and stuff when you were, you know, you were really rough, you know, and cheating and whatever, you know, using foreign objects, whatever it took and stuff to get things going. But I wrestled in Durban, South Africa, 15 times and I had 11 police escorts out of the building. Wow. Where I either had to stay till everybody was gone or they would all get around me and load me in the back of a police car and get me out of there. So it was pretty hairy and stuff. I mean, I had a couple in Cape Town, Mexico City. So, I mean, it was, it could be scary when those things would, would really kick off and everything was getting thrown. I mean, I had, I was tagging with Warlord. Okay. You down South Florida, you'll know who Terry is. And we were we had another riot we had to fight our way through. And it, the tennis stadium that we worked at, it had a big brick wall to protect. It was so they could it would protect the tennis balls from hitting the windows and stuff going into the foyer and everything. Well, you had to walk the under behind the wall to get to the doors, but you had to walk under the balcony. So, I mean, with everybody throwing stuff, and I was used to, you know, having some some times like that when people were throwing things in Mexico. They were real bad about doing that. But they like to pee in a cup and then throw it in your face. Oh, goodness gracious. <laughs> you know, and I had had a partner and stuff down there who that had happened to, and I mean, he got such an eye infection from it. You know, so I learned and stuff, when I got close to the, where the people were, so if I learned to duck my head. And that night and stuff, as we were going back, warlord was in front of me and they used they used the the rim of a tire and stuff that they'd welded a, a metal rod in to use it as stanchions you know between the seating and stuff going up the steps somebody had taken that tire iron or the rim and dropped it off the balcony and stuff and thank god i was looking down and it caught the top of my head and just peeled it you know if i've been standing straight up it, it might have killed me and stuff on that one if it hit me direct enough in the head well, no, I I really see why you wrote a book because you should have like like a Netflix like docu series or something like this because the stuff here is just crazy. Your book is not that long either, too. So I feel like it's like 120 pages or something like that, 125 pages. Like 
Right. I feel like you. there's at least a part for part two and part three already. I, I have a bit of a reasoning behind it. So I have Parkinson's disease. Okay. So my memory and stuff is not really good at times. So that was what I could remember at those. And after I got through writing, it's like, God, I didn't tell them. This. I didn't say this. I didn't say this. I didn't say this. I just forgot. And, you know, so now I've had a couple of people say, are you going to do another one with the rest of the stories that aren't in the book? Like, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> like a lot of this stuff, like, you know, uh, like I mentioned, I grew up in the 80s. And like the only thing I can equivalent to like your stories as far as me growing up was when Sergeant Slaughter became like an Iraqi sympathizer at the time. Right. And people like really yeah. wanted the guy's head at the time because we all thought like he had literally had joined up with Saddam Hussein and all these people yeah that was that was kind of what it was like going through some of the places especially when i was in south africa and so i really had a, you know i have issues and stuff in a lot of different buildings in south africa so i mean but i enjoyed it you know it's one thing and stuff after it's all said and done you sit back in the dressing room you get stitched up or patched up whatever you need to do and you kind of sit back and take a deep breath and said you know i did my job right tonight if i can take everybody to the, to that point, to such a frenzy that they want to kill me, I did something right. I guess Sick the, and crazy as it sounds and stuff, you still got to feel that, or I did anyway. It's a positive way of looking at things, I guess, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now, there are three guys that absolutely terrified me as a child. And one of these guys you were familiar with. Now, the three guys that terrified me as a child were the Great Muda, Cactus Jack, and Abdullah the Butcher. <laughs> You have to give me some stories yeah, about Abby was scary around the, Abdul the Butcher. Abby was scary back in the days and stuff, you know, when everybody was still thinking that, you know, during the K Fabe days and stuff, people didn't know how to handle Abby. But I loved working with him. He was one of my favorite people in my career that I worked with was Abdullah and stuff. Cause I mean, I, I enjoyed the, you know, as big as I was, I kind of developed more of a brawling type of style. And, you know, a lot of promoters didn't, you know, when I was early, like when I was in Puerto Rico, didn't really want me trading holds and things like that, you know, and doing actual wrestling. I mean, I was trained by Dory Funk Jr. You know, Dory was one of the best scientific wrestlers in the business. And so my style and stuff developed closer to more like a Bruiser Brody type style and stuff than, than anything else. So, I mean, that working with Abby and stuff, that really blended well with where I was going with my career. That kind of pushed me more toward that style. But it was, it was amazing working with him. And I mean, the, when we would be outside fighting, the things that he could see on the floor to use as a weapon or or something like that amazed me because I was like, where did you, how did you see that? Because I didn't see it. And he's guiding me over to something. He's like, there it is. Oh, okay. <laughs> and Abby did the greatest thing for me. And I've, I've always appreciated it. And I've told him that a dozen times. That the first time I wrestled Abdullah was in a big baseball stadium in Bayamon there in Puerto Rico. And we were having our match and stuff. And I saw Abby get the fork out. So I'm I'm getting ready because I know what's coming. And he says, block the, sp block the fork and take it away from me. So I blocked it, took it away, hit him a few times and stuff with it. He's, he's bleeding like a stuck hog. And he wouldn't let me bleed that night. And I mean, the people from Puerto Rico and stuff were behind me because I was probably one of the few people, that, if not the only one, that they had ever seen work Abdullah and stuff in a, in a big match and not bleed. So he kind of made me in Puerto Rico by doing that for me. So, cause they thought, you know, he's wrestled Abdullah and stuff and look at what Carlos Colon and Vader and them have all, you know, bled buckets and stuff working with him. And I didn't bleed a drop. So that just, well, boy, he must be something. And after, that was what really made me in Puerto Rico. And I've always been very appreciative for, for what he did. And we were, you know, I was fortunate to work with him in Japan and, you know, some other places and stuff. So, I mean, it was, it always, it was a night off for me. And so when I worked with that, I always look forward to those matches. Was there, was there any like interesting or funny story you have with Abdul the Butcher? Like, did you guys go out to dinner anywhere? Did you guys travel together? Um, not really. Cause you know, we only on the buses and stuff in Japan, you know, Puerto Rico was a heavy cafe place. So, you know, we, they wouldn't even let, the heels and the baby faces get anywhere close to each other. You know, we could be fired just from riding to the arena with each other. 
you know, were being seen out on the town. And it was tough for me in Puerto Rico because I was the only American baby face. All the other Americans and stuff were healed. So I really had nobody to hang out with. Okay. You know, so, but yeah, with, you know, Abby and I had dinner and stuff in Japan and stuff a few times. And he would take me with him and stuff when they, you know, like sponsors would come to take him out and, and go drink and eat and things like that and stuff. And he, he took me with him a few times and stuff. So, but we had a good relationship. Yeah, because you look just like a normal dude. But Abdul the Butcher has like all the scars. I've just imagined like waitresses like walking over oh, to Abdul. Trust me, if you get close enough in here, oh, stuff, you I got so... skinny across. Okay. I don't want I don't want to insult you. Yeah, your now you start seeing the scars and stuff coming <laughs> okay. But uh and that was really a, a good thing about going across versus going up and down. The scars and stuff go with the flow of the skin and stuff. When you go up and down, you're cutting against the grain of your skin, so at least bigger and deeper scars. But my gosh, and stuff, he was juicing every night of his career practically. So, you know, if you look, I've, I have seen him before take like three poker chips and stick them in the scars in his forehead. They were that deep. Wow. Yeah, that that's just like, to me, that's a, like... I don't know. I get a little cut and I take a little paper towel and I <laughs> heal myself. This guy's got poker chips on his head. Oh yeah. He just had grooves. He didn't have scars. He had grooves. In he his grooves. Head. <laughs> <laughs> now, what about, uh, you know, another big man that you were pretty fond with was also Yokozuna. Yeah. You know, um, can you just tell me a bit about a little bit about your relationship with Yokozuna? You know, Rod and I met when I first broke in and you know, I didn't really, I was so green. I was only probably 10 matches under my belt when I had a tag match with him and Samu. And of course I didn't know any better and they beat me half to death. And that was the only time I'd wrestle them. And then um, I was working, I'd gone back to working in Mexico again, but this time as giant warrior instead of Butch Masters. And for a different office, I was working for UWA, which worked out of Cuatro Caminos and stuff it was a big arena in Mexico City, the bullfighting arena that they worked out of. And they um, they would always bring in three Americans at a time. So I had gone in with two of the Puerto Rican guys for my first week there. And then my second week, they brought Rodney in and stuff and put us together. And we had a great reaction from the people. And Minus loved us together. And we enjoyed being around each other. And next thing you know, and stuff, we're a steady tag coming in for almost two years. You know, that we would come in for two weeks, go out for four and come back for two and then just kind of work that that type of schedule and stuff. So we had um, got to be really close during all that time in, you know, in Mexico. And we talked to each other all the time on the phone when we, um, you know, when, when we were home and we weren't in Mexico together. And then I moved to South Africa and we lost touch with each other. And by that time and stuff, he had gone to WWF as Yokozuna. So when I was at wrestling and working in the office and stuff, I did bodyguarding work in South Africa and did a lot of security stuff. And somebody called us and stuff and said, would y'all be interested in doing, um, we've got a big wrestling group coming in from the States. Would y'all be interested in taking care of the security for it? And so I just started laughing and stuff. You know, my boss and stuff was like, do you want to go do this? I'm like, wait a minute. I get paid for a week and stuff of hanging out with all my friends. <laughs> sure. Let's right. do this. Sign them, sign me and up, they've right? Got, they've got this one big guy and stuff, though, that somebody's going to have to drive because he can't fit on the bus. So we have to get a van for just him. So if you've got somebody, well, then they told me who it was. And I, I was the one who took over the driving, you know, with that one. And so we had met him at the at the hotel they were staying as they were coming down. It's just like, that guy can hardly fit on the elevator, but he couldn't see me. I was standing behind some trees and stuff, like, you know, bushes for decorations and stuff like that. He said, I know that voice. And after that stuff, we were in contact, you know, every time they came into the country and, you know, I worked for them. And then I had left and moved back to the States. And we had gone on a tour to Saudi Arabia and kind of really reconnected and stuff there. And he had a tour booked for England and wanted me to go with him and stuff. So he got that all arranged for me to go with him and stuff on that English tour. And, you know, I don't know 
exactly what the whole cause of it was. You know, I, I still remember it was, um, they had actually done the pay-per-view where Rikishi got thrown off the top of the cage into the pickup truck. Right. Okay. I remember that. Yeah. And he had watched that because it showed up in his hotel bill and stuff that he had had that pay-per-view. And when we came back the next day, cause we'd been on a long trip where we were on the road for about five or six days down there. And I mean, you know, five, six, seven hours in a, in a van all the time and went to go get him. He was staying in a different place than where I was. I was staying in a boarding house and he was in one of the hotels in Liverpool and went to go get him. And he didn't, he wasn't there. He didn't, he didn't come down. And I mean, it wasn't like him and stuff to be, you know, late and stuff. So we said something to management and they went up and uh, opened up his room and he just looked like he was peacefully asleep. Wow. You know, she's pulled up his chest, his hand over his chest, and he was gone. Oh, wow. You know, so that, was, that was really hard. Um, the promoter over there didn't do a lot to help, try to help get him back to the States. Um, the hotel and stuff that, we, that he was staying in was really good. They gave me a room, and they gave me a telephone in a conference room and said, you call whoever you need for him. You know, so I always appreciated how nice they were and stuff you know, with trying to get him back home. And so I talked to Rikishi, uh, Arthur, and maybe Sika. <clears throat> and his sister came over to help bring the body back home. And so I helped her with all the arrangements. The hotel set her up a room as well. And she and I sat a lot of times at the funeral home and stuff with him, you know, until we could get the arrangements made and to, to get him back home. And so once we did, then, you know, she flew back to the States with him and I, I stayed and finished the tour. And, you know, that was the the hardest thing in the world was trying to do the tour, you know, trying to finish it without him. Cause I mean, he was the big reason why I was there to begin with. And I, it still tears my heart out to think about him every day. You know, there's, and he was a big Jack Daniels drinker. Okay. Every year and stuff on the anniversary and stuff. I have a shot of Jack Daniels and I don't even drink anymore, but I still have one shot of Jack Daniels on the day he died. It's a great way to keep his memory alive. I think it's important. Our yeah. loved ones. I know like f from my dad, you know, on the day that I lost him, I have chicken wings for his, for his uh, day that he passed away. Cause it was right. his favorite food. Having Jack Daniels, Yokozuna. Yeah. Even though you don't drink, it's your salute to him. And that yeah, it really shows you know, as somebody who doesn't drink anymore, to have that drink that really shows how much he did. I mean, this him. has been it was twenty two years in October, and I mean, I still can get choked up thinking about him or things that we used to do or talking about him and stuff. Sometimes and stuff, I can have a really hard time, you know, trying to deal with that. But you know, he's one of the greatest people I've ever met. Wow. You know, and probably ever will meet. And I mean, I've always had the utmost respect for everything that he accomplished in the wrestling world, but more and stuff of what he and I shared in Mexico and stuff outside of the wrestling ring when it was just the two of us hanging out and just, you know, kicking it and seeing out, you know, what we want to do and how each other's doing, keeping up with each other's lives and, and everything else. And I mean, I cherish all that time I got to spend with him and, you know, it's, if there's about three people that have been in my life in total and that I wish my wife that I have now and stuff would have met and Rodney's the, the biggest person I would have loved for him to meet. Now you obviously have met a lot of people and obviously Yokozuna uh, meant a lot to you. And you said that he was a nice guy, but another nice guy that you only, I believe only had one interaction with was Owen Hart. Right. Can you tell me about that as well too? Um. World title matches in Mexico. You always have the wrestler and then you have a second. So somebody else goes to the ring with you with the towel and they're cheering you on and wiping you down and all this. Other. Well, Owen was the one that went with me. And Owen was working as the Blue Blazer then. So they were wanting to... Um, he was... They were going to set something up out of our finish except for him to come back because he was still going to be there another two weeks. I was going out as he was coming in. So they were setting up a match between somebody else and him, you know, for a mask versus mask match. So Owen and I go out to do the match. And the finish ended up being and stuff is that we bumped the ref 
I was wrestling against Connect, which was one of the Mexican legends. And we had worked to finish, you know, pile drivers were illegal in Mexico. That was an okay. automatic disqualification to do a pile driver. So we did set him up for the pile driver. Owen got on the corner and stuff and got his feet. And we did the, the spike pile driver on him. And so I did the cover. The ref counted to three. And then everything started flying into the ring and the ref reversed the decision because he got scared. And so Owen and I are trying to figure out that, I mean, it was a full blown riot and they're throwing everything under the sun at us. And I had been down there before. So I knew that the old peso coins were heavy as could be and were worth nothing. So they had no problems throwing those things. And I had been cutting the back of the ear from, from a peso before, you know, early the first time I went to Mexico. So that's how I learned it the hard way. And so we st we knew to get chairs and stuff. We put we're carrying chairs over our heads and stuff so people couldn't throw coins, you know, and hit us with rocks and bottles and everything else in the face. So we we're protecting our faces. And as we were going up through that crowd, somebody and stuff cut me back and forth. And um, we still just kept pushing through till we could get to the dressing room. And when we got back there, we didn't realize just how bad I was cut. And I mean, I ended up going to the hospital later that night. And I took 60 stitches inside and out to, to seal it. But I had to go. They wanted me to go do another match after that because I was booked somewhere else in town. So they packed everything in really tight. And we went to I went to the ring. We did our match. I stayed, I think I went in the ring for about two seconds, hit somebody and came back out because we didn't want it to bust back open. Well, when I went to the hospital, so, and I talked to Owen earlier, so we were talking about, I had a two o'clock in the morning flight to go back to Puerto Rico. And during the time that I was doing the other match and went to the, um, went to the hospital to get the stitches, Owen had gotten the key to my room and went into my room and put everything and stuff together and stuff into my suitcase and he put out a change of clothes and stuff and left it on on the the bed and he left a note for me and his stuff he said i hope you're all right that was kind of a crazy night we had tonight and said if you ever need anything give me a call and left his number for me and that's that was my time with owen you know everybody talked about what a, a great river owen was with everybody and stuff but to me and stuff he was you know he was just a great guy and stuff that helped take care of me and stuff in a bad time unfortunately he didn't get a chance to play a practical joke on you right which i'm sure would have been a, another good story right. <laughs> now it's kind of crazy because it's like you know you're talking about people throwing pesos and chairs and everything and here you know like when I think of like people throwing stuff and not that anybody should ever throw anything into the ring, but it's like, I just remember the NWO and it's like beers and popcorn and, oh. and stuff like that. It just seems like, like I welcome candy that. being thrown into the ring versus like what you guys went through. I welcome that popcorn and <laughs> cokes and stuff. That was, that was nothing compared to what we, I mean, I've had spark plugs, um, bottles, rocks, um cinder blocks one of the big spiny cactuses i had thrown at me one night in mexico uh so i mean you know on top of getting stabbed five times and all the bang that you know getting my head split open and you know it was just a crazy life and stuff back then and i think it was because it was mostly during the k it was all during the cafe bear and stuff so i mean the fans and stuff would really get invested in in their they're heroes and especially overseas and stuff because that's their local guy. And I'm the big nasty American coming in and stuff to, you know, and taking advantage of him. You know, I'm too big and stuff to be wrestling against him. You need to be wrestling against two guys or you need to be wrestling against somebody else and stuff. So, I mean, I got to hear all of that and stuff, but I mean, they would get behind those people and, and if they can't beat you, they're going to help their hero beat you. Wow. And that was where, you know, things would get started. And like I said, during the riots, when you're fighting your way back through the dressing room, you know, you're catching punches and kicks and, you know, everything else along the way. But yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a scary time some nights. It's, it was legit. Like, yeah, <laughs> people took it really well, damn yeah. seriously. And like I said, it was whatever they could find to throw. You know, they would take paper cups and fill them with dirt and pack down the top of it to throw those. So it was more solid you know, and peeing in cups and trying to throw it in your face and uh, Mexico and stuff. I had somebody throw 
you know, the angel hair that you use at Christmas. Oh, right. Snow looking stuff. Well, that's fiberglass. And so they would throw that at us. Well, then that fiberglass would get in your skin and then you're itching to death and stuff with that. So, yeah, I mean, I've seen some crazy stuff thrown in the rings at me. Well, we've talked about <laughs> it, it, it's just mind boggling. I'm just <laughs> spark plugs and cactuses and cinder blocks. Like it feels like an episode of The Simpsons, not real life. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> now we've mentioned some some great people, you know. Um, is there any one person in particular that you wrestled with and you were just like, oh, I wish if I had to do it all over again, I wish I never had to get in the ring with that person ever again. Hmm. I mean, I've not that I'm going to go into names and stuff, but I okay. mean, I've had, you know, somebody that we kind of had a disagreement with um, outside the ring and stuff over a, a situation on a tour and stuff that I just didn't want to be in the ring with him again. Okay. But other than that stuff, I mean, I, you know, I had some guys and stuff that were in Mexico because we, everything was a three on three. So a lot of times it's that there would be a couple of guys in there that just, they were just putting in more to feed them to us that were not pleasant to work with because they were just inexperienced and stuff. But I mean, that's working with any young guy and stuff, you know? So, I mean, yeah, I would get back in the ring with just about anybody I've ever been in the ring with before. Okay. Well, it sounds like you've had pretty pleasant, positive experiences then. Yeah. I've worked with, you know, you know, worked with dynamite kid, you know, and some people said, Oh, he can be bad, but, he was good with me. Now he mistimed his flying headbutt and broke my cheekbone. Oh, but other than that, I would still get back in the ring with him the next night. Okay. So, yeah, I don't think I've ever really been in that I did, just didn't want to work with. Well, I'm glad to hear that. That's obviously a positive thing. Yes. Now, speaking of speaking of positive things, you are inducted into the uh, Southern Pro Wrestling Hall of yes. Fame. Can you tell me about a little bit about that and what that meant to you? You know, it was um, took place there in da in Dallas, was where um, David Fuller runs that, and it was, you know, it was a great honor for me because you know I figured I've lived overseas all my you know my career and worked over there, you know it was kind of nice to get that recognition that I have you know that I actually did something and was good at what I did. So I mean that made me really happy and really proud, and I went in. Uh, my class was. Dr. Death, Steve Williams was in it. I think Terry Gordy may have been. But, I mean, Stan Hansen is in that. Cornette's in that. Uh, Killer Carl Cox. I mean, there's a lot of people that are in that that Hall of Fame. And they were like, well, you were, you're from the South. You're from Texas. You know, so you still considered, you know, a Southern wrestler. And so that was, you know, so it was, it was a great honor to me and stuff to, to go into that. I was really, really proud and excited about going in. Well, congratulations. That kind of, uh, you know, stamp on your, on your wrestling yeah, career. Kind of I mean, for anybody, I right? For 30 years. Now, I'm still to this day, you know, my favorite wrestling organization of all time was WCW. Huge WCW right. fan. I watched it until the ship went down. Um, speaking of the ship going down on WCW, you were about yeah. to have a little something going on. And then you saw the ship go down at the same time, but yeah, hard. You're <laughs> I, got a bad feeling. I got a bad taste on that one. Uh, I had been working in Germany and there were a couple of guys from WCW that were over there and God, I can't remember. It's one of the announcers, uh, Dave Penzer, I believe. Okay. Had gone back and talked to the office about me. Said, oh, we've got this guy. So, you know, because back then I said I had the long black hair and the black goatee. So Kevin Nash and I looked a lot alike. And so um they had come up with the idea. So I think Kevin had done something with the naturals or something like that, where they all turned on him. And so they were going to bring me in and put me with Kevin and stuff as like a cousin or something. They're going to make me us related somehow. And I talked to Paul Orndorff and everything was set up. I was going into Jackson, Mississippi the next week. And I'm watching the show to see if they're, you know, if they're setting anything up for us. You know, so I knew kind of what to expect when I got there. And here comes Shane McMahon saying, well, we bought WCW. That was the end of it. I called, got a hold of Orndorff, and he said, 
I, 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 he said, I wish better for you. I thought we could have done something with you and stuff, but he said, there's, it's out of my hands now. And so there went my WCW career. Oh, that would have been so interesting because, you know, WCW, I felt like needed some rejuvenation at the time because they were. It would have been fun and stuff tagging with Kevin. I didn't know him, but, um, you know, I had heard a lot about him because I worked for Shawn Michaels when he had gotten away from when he <clears throat> was hurt and had his own wrestling promotion in San Antonio. So I'd heard a lot about Kevin and stuff through talking with Sean. And I ended up doing a tour with him to South Africa later on, 2004 or five, something like that, and got to meet him. Real nice guy. Enjoyed talking to him. And I thought it would have been a lot of fun and stuff to be tagged with him and be with him all the time. So I think I would have really enjoyed that. Yeah, I think that would have been a, a fun little storyline going yeah. on there in WCW at the time. Like, what do you think go WCW going out of business meant to the industry at that time? Well, pretty well closed it off. You know, Vince was it. If you really wanted to make money in wrestling, you had to work for WWE. And, you know, so there was really nothing except for little, little indies and stuff. And I tried talking to, to Ring of Honor and they told me I was too big. So couldn't get in there, you know, so I went back to working overseas again and, you know, doing stuff in Europe and South Africa, Mexico, you know, back where I'd spent a lot of time. But I mean, it really, when Vince bought everything, it just shut it down because that's the only game in town. You know, it's kind of like looking at ice cream. You know, if you get vanilla ice cream all the time, you don't know that you like vanilla because that's all you know. But now when you have AEW come in, now you've got chocolate. So do you like chocolate or vanilla? Well, I, I like both of them, so I'll go back and forth. You know, you couldn't do that back then because it was only Vince. Right. That's what, that, That's what's great now is like, uh, you know, I grew up, again, during that Attitude Era and WCW and ECW and WWE. And then right. now, now you get to see all the people arguing again about how much they hate one another or what the other one and how much they love one another. It's just, it's it's a good time. It's a, It's actually a great time again to be a wrestling fan here in 2000. Right, because now you've got variety. You've got choices, exactly. Now, well, other plus than... people now are seeing, you know, you'll get to see AAA and stuff on television. You can see New Japan on television now. And that was stuff you didn't see. I mean, when I first started working in Mexico, in probably the first two or three years I was there, they didn't have television. And really, so everything worked off of magazines and posters and you know, loyal fans and everything else. And I mean, those buildings were packed every week without having television. And it was kind of like when they brought television to Mexico, it started killing the houses because now we can stay home and watch it without having to go to the arenas. Mm -hmm. And now we're getting it for free. We don't have to pay for it. You know, so the crowd started going down in Mexico a lot. You know, when, te when television started, at least with UWF, this was the case. So yeah, now it's the people are getting, and plus you've got the internet. How do you watch wrestling from everywhere on the internet? There's too you much. Know? I can't I can't watch it all. Right. And I mean, pick a country, you can pretty well find somebody and stuff on the internet that's got a match. Yeah, but there's you still know. something about that live experience that definitely oh, sure. overtakes watching it on TV. Yeah, it's always better live. Yeah. You know? you know, I can remember the first time I ever saw a live match and stuff when I was a kid. And it was just like, oh my gosh, this is a lot different than watching it on television. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, I loved going to the live shows then. And, I mean, you know, I grew up in Amarillo, Texas, which is how I knew the funk so well. I went to school with Dory Funk Jr.'s kids. So that's how I got to know know them. And, I mean, Dory used to leave me tickets and stuff. for. I had two tickets every week at the Amarillo Sports Arena to go to the matches, whether I used them or not. There were two tickets for me every week, and I went every chance I got. I love Except the fact that you just season. said – I love the fact that you just said go to the matches. Yeah. That, that, that's the term I remember my dad saying to me, we're going to the matches this weekend. Yep. Like, and I loved it. I mean, I would, after my, probably my first live match and stuff, I was like, this is what I want to be. I want to be a professional wrestler. And I had talked to Terry after one of my basketball games in my senior year. And so I said, I still want to be a wrestler. And he's like, well, he said, we'll talk about it. Stuff. Wait, you know, he said, Go to school, get you a degree. He said, then call me or Dory and stuff and we'll train you. So I went to, you know, I went to university more to play basketball and I got a degree along the way. You know, so 
Um, I had gone to Europe. I was playing over there, had contract problems, came home. And I was just so disenchanted with playing basketball. I was burned out. You know, I've been playing competitively since I was eight. And I called Terry and told him the stuff that I, I was ready to come learn to be a wrestler. He said, well, let me, he said, I've got to run right now. I said, I'll give you a call tomorrow. Well, little did I know, Terry talks things over with Dory. Dory called my dad because they had known each other since high school. So Dory calls my dad and said, did he get his degree? My dad said, yes. They called me the next day, said, you still want to be a wrestler? I said, yep. Well, I didn't know it until about two or three weeks later. My dad said, yeah, Dory called to see if, uh, if you graduated from college yet. He was keeping so he track. Was to take care of me, so I had something to fall back on if wrestling didn't work. But that was what I always wanted to, do, to be, was a wrestler. Mm -hmm. And I became one. Yeah. Almost 31 years of it. 31 years. 31 years. And why and when did you decide to hang up the boots for good? Um, when I got diagnosed with Parkinson's. Okay. You know, I'm fortunate now. I, ha I, I, I have a really good doctor that she keeps me pretty level. So a lot of my Parkinson's symptoms don't, don't show up a lot. Um, but that was, I, I knew I couldn't do it. And at that point stuff, my head, this is about four years ago and my health started declining really quick. You know, I've developed other things along the way, but you know, autonomic neuropathy, which, you know, affects my whole nervous system and especially the smooth muscles, like your heart, your lungs, your brain, and at any time and stuff, it could shut it down Oh wow! without any you know, I go sleep tonight and stuff and it could, that neuropathy kick in, just shut everything down. Oh, wow. You know, so once I got that way, I started having a lot of balance problems to the point that I was even in a wheelchair about six months ago. And I've gotten out of that now. Um, I went to Mexico and got stem cells. <laughs> Best thing in the world. Okay. I'll recommend it to everybody. But that pretty well made it to where I couldn't, I couldn't wrestle anymore. And, mm -hmm. you know, until I got under the right meds and everything, my speech and stuff was real bad. You couldn't understand me very well. And I st still get stuck on words from time to time, mm -hmm. but not that often. Cause like I said, I've got a good doctor. It's got me on the right regimen and stuff with pills and, you know, everything else and stuff. So, I mean, it's not as noticeable. It's more noticeable if you're with me in person, cause you can see my hand shaking and, you know, everything else with that one, or I, you know, I get stumbled on words and I can't get them out. Well, you're sounding absolutely great so far. Like yeah. I, I wouldn't I'm even be able to I'm tell. I'm having a good night. Okay. Um, but make sure I took a couple of extra pills before we did. <laughs> I would. Oh, now <laughs> what are you doing to keep busy nowadays? Um, I know you're doing some important stuff out there. Too. My wife and I are co-founders of At Large Public Relations, which is a PR company and stuff that we work with people all over the world and stuff. You know, help trying to get them into magazines, books, TV. I mean, we've had stuff in Times, Forbes, the Ellen DeGeneres show, uh, ESPN. I mean, we've had a lot of, we've had some good success for a small little independent company. And then we also have uh, Clarence Publishing, which is a publishing company and a ghostwriting company. Okay. So we do a lot of ghostwriting and stuff for other people will call us in and stuff and say, I, I want to do a book, but I, I don't know how, or I don't have the time or, so we, we match them up with our, you know, we've got several ghostwriters on staff. So we just match them up with the right person and they take it and we can take a book from idea throw it to the shelf. So we can cover the whole gambit and stuff of getting a book on the shelf. Okay. So it, it keeps us busy. You know, I, I try to help my wife as best as I can, but you know, that's with the Parkinson's and everything. And it, it's affected my, my memory to where I'm, I have early onset dementia now. Okay. So it makes it hard for me to do stuff with her all the time. I just have bad days, but you know, when I'm having a good day, then, you know, I try to do the, you know, I, I try to help her where I can. We've got a, a decent little blog going stuff called style and sand. It's really just, we cover everything under the sun on that and scuba diving stuff and, you know, trips that we take and things to see in other cities and along the way. And so we have fun with that, but yeah, it keeps us busy. Okay. Are you do also doing like anti-bullying stuff as well too? I was, you were. I was. Okay. So when I was just about to retire, when I was getting really close to retiring and stuff, I went into doing motivational speaking for a little while. 
So I was trying to go to high schools, but it's just, it's hard to make money instead of speaking to high schools because they don't have the money in the budget to pay you very much. So you kind of start doing some of those just because it's enough to put a little money in my pocket, cover my expenses and, you know, um, you know, it kind of passed time and I enjoyed working with the kids and stuff and working because, you know, I mean, that's a big problem with kids and stuff today is bullying, both cyber bullying and in school and outside of school and everything else. So, I mean, I was glad to be a part of that, but I just, I couldn't make a living doing it. So I, I, I had to quit, you know, but I enjoyed working with the kids and, you know, I did a little bit, not a lot, but I mean, I hope I was able to help a couple of kids along the way and stuff. And if I did, I'm happy as can be. Right. Yeah. It's such an important thing to do. Definitely. Um, anything else you'd like to say? I mean, uh, other than, you know, people should definitely pick up this book because it's sure. an need awesome a read. Gift, need a Christmas gift to go on Amazon and get somebody a copy of my book. It's the one place, you know, you get on Amazon, you can actually get it in time for Christmas. Any place else you're screwed, but Amazon, you can still get it. Yes. And I have, Christmas. it's available on Amazon books. It's available on ebook. It's also available on audiobook. So there's three different ways you can get this book. Awesome. Well, is there anything else we should know, Jeff, before we let you go? Oh, you know, not that I can pretty well say it. I mean, I think we've covered a lot of stuff. There's a lot, you know, get the book if you want to know more about me. And, um, you know, I've enjoyed being on here with you tonight. And ever need me again, I'll be here. Just let me know. Awesome. No, I appreciate you. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating conversations. And definitely the book here is uh, whether it's Christmas time or not Christmas time. After the holidays, you need a, a great story to read. Netflix kind of picked this up. Hulu, somebody out there, Peacock. Good stories <laughs> in here. Good stories in here. It would make for, I'd love to see that. It would make for great programming. I'm telling you right now, for sure. Well, Jeff, where, where can uh, people follow you? Uh, you can follow me on jeff.bearden at Instagram. Uh, J. Bearden, J. W. Bearden at large on Twitter. And then I have a giant warrior page on Facebook. Okay. Absolutely perfect. Well, Jeff, thank you so much. It was. Oh, thank you. I enjoyed it. Oh, tonight. no, it was absolutely fantastic talking to you. And I'm actually going to read the book a second time because I'm sure there was stuff I have to like reread after hearing your stories again. I'm going to give it to my wife too to read it. Like, you got to read this book. It was, yeah, it was I hope really y'all enjoy great. it. It was really great. Well, Jeff, well, thank you so much for taking some time out. I really did enjoy speaking with you this evening. Thanks, Tony. I enjoyed it too. All right, guys, if you like interviews like this with Jeff Bearden, make sure you hit that red subscribe button so you can stay tuned in here to Toned In Entertainment for future videos. Subscribe to the channel. Do it. Go now. Do it now.